Ms. Ferris, let me show you this picture 5B. Do you see any bruising in the general area on the chest of the child, Melody Carter? Yes, I can see it's there. You can see it on picture 5B, yes. Please point out where you see it. This is bruising in here. May we have some marking device, any color? Do we have red? Yes, why don't I ask you simply to indicate on this picture all of the areas where you saw bruising. Draw a line around the area, okay? Well, it's pretty difficult. It's difficult to draw a line around the entire area. Well, to the best of your ability, I would say around this area here, there would be, in my opinion, bruising, all right? Was there also bruising on the arms? I can't recall. You don't recall? I can't see it in this picture. Okay. Was there any on the stomach area? Not that I recall. Okay. Will you show us where on your shoulders you saw the bruising? I think it would be up in this area in here, as near as I can remember. One shoulder only, one shoulder only. Will you put your initials on the side here? Yes. Now, Directing your attention to 16JJ, is there any area of bruising that you see in this picture? I can't tell. In 16JJ, I can't tell. Excuse me, I can't tell. Indeed, you notice the right hand of the victim, Melody Carter, whether it was bruised at all? I don't recall. Okay, in photo P9, do you see any bruising? I do not. In picture 16HH, does it help you to recall if there was any bruising on the arm? No, it doesn't. All right. <clears throat> then one more, 5E. Is there any area you can see here as an area of bruising? It would appear that now there might be some bruising under the arm here. Will you make a circle around there? Is there any other area on this picture where you can see bruising? Not that I recall and observe at this time. Now let's see. Were you present when the body was retrieved from inside the refrigerator? I was. How was the body transported to the morgue in a disaster bag? What is that? That's a plastic lined bag that has a canvas exterior. The bag is body length with two zippers that open the bag flap. We transport cases of this nature in the bag for purposes of removal. What is it deposited on? It's deposited on a stretcher. Now when the body was lifted into this disaster bag, did you notice whether it was clothed or unclothed? The body was partially clothed. Do you remember what the deceased was wearing at that time? Yes, I do. One sock and a torn, blood-stained t-shirt. Did you observe on the body any place an orange-yellowish mark? I don't recall. And did you observe whether there was some blood on the vegetation under the head of the deceased or in some other area? Yes. Did you measure the amount of blood? I did not. How much blood did you find under the head of the deceased? There wasn't a great deal. Can you tell us how much was there? I would have no way of making an estimate. Did the blood congeal on the vegetation? Well, it had a form of coagulation, but it was hard to discern because of the snow. Was there any snow under the body of the deceased? I couldn't say. May I have exhibit 16HH, 16HH, Your Honor? May I approach the witness? You may. I'm showing you 16HH. Can you tell us whether it is possible to see any blood in the picture? Well, there's blood in that area there, and there's blood in the area of the forehead and ear. That's on the deceased. How about the ground or the surrounding vegetation? I couldn't tell from that. After all, this is not the position she was found in by us. Now 5E, is this the original position? Yes, ma'am. Did you find any blood there that you can show us at this time? No, ma'am. How about 16II? 16II? Correction, 16JJ. This shows the face of the deceased in the original position. Is the blood visible? It was there, Ms. Ferris, at the time the body of Melanie Carter was found. How was she identified at the morgue as Jane Doe, number 158? How was positive identification made on Jane Doe, number 158? Through dental records furnished by the parents of Melanie Carter, is this the customary procedure in cases of this type? Yes. When a body has started to decay, it is difficult to get a positive ID unless we use some other form of identification. Were other forms of identification used to verify the identity of the deceased? No. The only thing we had to go on was the dental charts because of the age of the child and the stage of decomposition of the body when it was discovered.
<clears throat> Ms. Ferris, let me show you this picture 5B. Do you see any bruising in the general area on the chest of the child, Melody Carter? Yes, I can see it's there. You can see it on picture 5B? Yes. Please point out where you see it. This is bruising in here. May we have some marking device, any color? Do we have red? Yes. Why don't I ask you simply to indicate on this picture all of the areas where you saw bruising. Draw a line around the area, okay? Well, it's pretty difficult. It's difficult to draw a line around the entire area. Well, to the best of your ability, I would say around this area here, there would be, in my opinion, bruising. All right. Was there also bruising on the arms? I can't recall. You don't recall? I can't see it in this picture. Okay. Was there any on the stomach area? Not that I recall. Okay, will you show us where on the shoulders you saw the bruising? I think it would be up in this area in here, as near as I can remember. One shoulder only, one shoulder only. Will you put your initials on the side here? Yes. Now directing your attention to 16JJ. Is there any area of bruising that you see in this picture? I can't tell. In 16JJ, I can't tell. Excuse me, I can't tell. Did you notice the right hand of the victim, Melody Carter, whether it was bruised at all? I don't recall. Okay. In photo P9, do you see any areas of bruising? I do not. In picture 16HH, does it help you to recall if there was any bruising on the arm? No, it doesn't. All right. Then one more, 5E. Is there any area you can see here as an area of bruising? It would appear that so there might be some bruising under the arm here. Will you make a circle around there? Is there any other area on this picture where you can see bruising? Not that I recall and observe at this time. Now let's see. Were you present when the body was retrieved from inside the refrigerator? I was. How was the body transported to the morgue? In a disaster bag. Well, what is that? That's a plastic lined bag that has a canvas exterior. Now the bag is body length with two zippers that open the bag flap. We transport cases of this nature in the bag for purposes of removal. What is it deposited on? It's deposited on a stretcher. Now when the body was lifted into this disaster bag, did you notice whether it was closed or unclosed? The body was partially clothed. And do you remember what the deceased was wearing at that time? Yes, I do. One sock and a torn blood-stained t-shirt. Did you observe on the body any place an orange yellowish mark? I don't recall. And did you observe whether there was some blood on the vegetation under the head of the deceased or in some other area? Yes. Did you measure the amount of blood? I did not. How much blood did you find under the head of the deceased? There wasn't a great deal. Can you tell us how much was there? I would have no way of making an estimate. Did the blood congeal on the vegetation? Well, it had a form of coagulation, but it was hard to discern because of the snow. Was there any snow under the body of the deceased? I couldn't say. May I have exhibit 16HH, 16HH? Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. I'm showing you 16HH. Can you tell us whether it is possible to see any blood in the picture? Well, there's blood in that area there, and there's blood in the area of the forehead and ear. That's on the deceased. How about the ground or the surrounding vegetation? I couldn't tell from that. After all, this is not the position she was found in by us. Now, 5E, is this the original position? Yes, ma'am. Did you find any blood there that you can show us at this time? No, ma'am. How about 16II? 16II? And correction, 16JJ. This shows the face of the deceased in the original position. Is the blood visible? It was there, Ms. Ferris, at the time the body of Melody Carter was found. How was she identified at the morgue as Jane Doe number 158? How was positive identification made on Jane Doe number 158? Through dental records furnished by the parents of Melody Carter. Is this the customary procedure in cases of this type? Yes. When a body has started to decay, it is difficult to get a positive ID unless we use some other form of identification. Were other forms of identification used to verify the identity of the deceased? No. The only thing we had to go on was the dental charts because of the age of the child and the stage of decomposition of the body when it was discovered. <clears throat> Ms. Ferris, let me show you this picture 5B. Do you see any bruising in the general area on the chest of the child, Melody Carter? Yes, I can see it's there. You can see it on the picture 5B? Yes, please point out where you see it. This is bruising in here. May we have some marking device? Any color? 
Do we have red? Yes. Why don't I ask you simply to indicate on this picture all of the areas where you saw bruising. Draw a line around the area, okay? Well, it's pretty difficult. It's difficult to draw a line around the entire area. Well, to the best of your ability, I would say around this area here, there would be, in my opinion, bruising. All right. Was there also bruising on the arms? I can't recall. You don't recall? I can't see it in this picture. Okay. Was there any on the stomach area? Not that I recall. Okay. Will you show us where on the shoulders you saw the bruising? I think it would be up in this area in here, as near as I can remember. One shoulder only, one shoulder only. Will you put your initials on the side here? Yes. Now directing your attention to 16JJ, is there any area of bruising that you see in this picture? I can't tell. In 16JJ, I can't tell. Excuse me, I can't tell. Did you notice the right hand of the victim, Melody Carter, whether it was bruised at all? I don't recall. Okay, in photo P9, do you see any areas of bruising? I do not. In picture 16HH, does it help you to recall if there was any bruising on the arm? No, it doesn't. All right. So then one more, 5E. Is there any area you can see here as an area of bruising? It would appear that there might be some bruising under the arm here. Will you make a circle around it there? Is there any other area on this picture where you can see bruising? Not that I recall and observe at this time. Now let's see, were you present when the body was retrieved from inside the refrigerator? I was. How was the body transported to the morgue in a disaster bag? What is that? That's a plastic lined bag that has a canvas exterior. The bag is body length with two zippers that open the bag flat. We transport cases of this nature in the bag for purposes of removal. What is it deposited on? It's deposited on a stretcher. Now when the body was lifted into this disaster bag, did you notice whether it was clothed or unclothed? No, the body was partially clothed. Do you remember what the deceased was wearing at that time? Yes, I do. One sock and a torn blood-stained t-shirt. What's that number? 33? That's 39, Your Honor. 39 has been admitted. Mrs. Meinford, showing you 38. Is that the front of the condominium that's at 85 Kodiak Circle in Palmer? Yes, it is. And this is 40. On the back, this says Unit 234. And number 40 also says Unit 234. Is that the carport area? Yes, it is. And does that show anchors and supports for a porch? Yes, it does. Are these supports and anchors installed in a crooked manner? Your Honor, that misstates. They are slanted. Very well, call them slanted. We'll let the jury take a look at the photos. They can decide. These beams are not vertical, straight up and down, are they? No, they are not. I show you Exhibit 41. Is that also the carport area? Yes, that's the same carport area. Just a minute, Mr. Phillips. Did you see Exhibit 141? No, Your Honor, I said 41. And this photo again shows crooked or slanted supports? Yes, and 41. Again, showing you Unit 234. Is that a different view of the carport area? Yes, it is. And Exhibit 43 also shows Space 234. Is that correct? Yes. In photo 44, it says Space 234 on the back of it. Is that again a picture of that same condominium? Yes. I'll offer these exhibits, Your Honor, and pass them over here. That's number 38. 49 is also circulating. I admitted 39. So it's through 44, and just to keep the record straight, if 38 is admitted. 39 has been admitted. If not, it's admitted. 41 is admitted. 42 is admitted. 44 is admitted. 45 has been admitted, but if in fact it hasn't been, 45 is admitted. Does that cover everything? Yes, Your Honor. And one other thing. May this diagram, Your Honor, be marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 46. May it be marked for identification as Exhibit 46. I will offer this exhibit. Any objection? No objection. Marked 46 and will be admitted. What's that number? 33? That's 39, Your Honor. 39 has been admitted. This is my bird showing you 38. Is that the front of the condominium that's at 85 Kodiak Circle in Palmer? Yes, it is. And this is 40. On the back, this says Unit 234, and number 40 also says Unit 234. Is that the carport area? Yes, it is. 
And does that show anchors and supports for a porch? Yes, it does. Are these supports and anchors installed in a crooked manner? Your Honor, that misstates. They are slanted. Very well, call them slanted. We'll let the jury take a look at the photos. They can decide. These beams are not vertical, straight up and down, are they? No, they are not. I show you Exhibit 41. Is that also the carport area? Yes, that's the same carport area. In just a minute, Mr. Phillips, did you say Exhibit 141? No, Your Honor, I said 41. And this photo again shows crooked or slanted supports? Yes, and 41 again. Now showing you Unit 234, is that a different view of the carport area? Yes, it is. And Exhibit 43 also shows Space 234, is that correct? Yes. In photo 44, it says Space 234 on the back of it. Is that, again, a picture of that same condominium? Yes. I'll offer these exhibits, Your Honor, and pass them over here. Now, that's number 38. 49 is also circulating. I admitted 39, so it's through 44. Just to keep the record straight, if 38 is admitted, 39 has been admitted. If not, it's admitted. 41 is admitted. 42 is admitted. 44 is admitted. 45 has been admitted. But if, in fact, it hasn't been, 45 is admitted. Does that cover everything? Yes, Your Honor. One other thing. May this diagram, Your Honor, be marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 46. May it be marked for identification as Exhibit 46. I will offer this exhibit. Any objection? No objection. Mark 46 and will be admitted. Two hundred four boys, fifteen minutes, examination by defense attorney. <clears throat> did the captain call you? It wasn't anything for him to call me three, four, five times per eight hour shift. And usually when he called, did you answer the phone or did he leave a message and you called him back? Usually answered the phone, okay? And there was some calling back on the message. Was there ever a time when the captain left a message for you to call him back and you didn't call him back? No, I wouldn't do that. So were there any other incidents that the captain talked to, to you about regarding your job performance at Toro? I really can't single out one instance. How about Captain McDonald? Can you recall anything that he talked to you about regarding unsatisfactory job performance at the Toro site? Yes. Can you tell me what that was? Actually, strike that. Do you remember when that was that the captain spoke to you? You asked me for dates, 91, 1991, the early part of the time, okay. My first encounter with him was the company brought me inside to the machine, gave me specific instructions, they even wrote them down. And if you get a certain degree or a certain number and where it would be at, you call Palm Springs and call the boss no matter what time it was. And one night it got up to 300 or whatever it was and I called Palm Springs and they told me to shut it off and they had showed me how to shut it off which was a switch. The captain was informed by the other guard that I went in there and messed with their machines and he got all over me about that, reprimanded me about that. When I tried to explain they specifically showed me how to do it and gave me instructions. He didn't listen to me, okay. But then the president of the company called Pinkerton and straightened it out that I had performed exactly like they asked me to. But that was the beginning of bitter feelings between the captain and I. Were there subsequent times when the captain spoke with you about unsatisfactory job performance? The next time, yes. What was the next time? I don't know if I have it in the right sequence, but one morning he came in at 8 o'clock and says that he could, he could nail me or something to that. I called at the office and found out that Ed wouldn't be to work and he said if I didn't cover the post that he could fire me and he didn't like my attitude, he's going to get Tyrone to work the post for me to get out of there. But that was a, and then I had another occasion where, let me stop you for a moment, you say that he told you that he didn't like your attitude, that's correct. And to your knowledge, do you have any idea why he said that? He walked in the door, which I have no knowledge that he was coming or anything, and he said, I could nail you. Please answer my question, though. Do you have any understanding, your personal knowledge, of why he would have said to you, I don't like your attitude? 
My personal knowledge is he had a grudge against me. So you don't think he was basing it on something, or to your knowledge, he wasn't basing it on anything, just a grudge? I had you because I wasn't around him that much. Okay. Was there another incident with the captain after that one? Yes. What was that incident? He came on the post, and I was standing at the patio at the entrance, and he got out of his car, and he asked who was my immediate supervisor, and I said, Ed. And he started pounding on top of the car and says, I'm your supervisor, immediate supervisor. Come on inside. I'm going to write you up. We will get back to that one because I do want to cover that in depth, but I want to try to keep this orderly. Was there any other time? When they fired me, it was another time. Okay, any others? I don't recall at this moment. How about Carl McRae? Were you ever spoken to by Carl about unsatisfactory job performance? Never. And because you had listed him before. Well, I did a lot of talking to Carl on the phone, and he asked me to put everything in writing, and I would write it and give it to Carl. Now, that was our relationship. So you were never counseled by Carl then about unsatisfactory job performance. Is that correct? Never that I know of. How about Captain Holman? Captain Holman? Sir, so we're clear. The question that counsel is asking now is, did Captain Holman ever talk to you about unsatisfactory job performance on your part? No. How about Gerald Scott? Did he ever speak with you about unsatisfactory job performance? No. He never spoke to me. I never came too much in contact with him. Do you recall ever being counseled or talked to by Mr. Scott for not carrying your officer's manual? And to my knowledge, never came on my post. That wasn't my question. Were you ever talked to by Mr. Scott about not carrying your officer's manual? No. Were you ever spoken to by anyone at Pinkerton about not carrying your officer's manual? The night I got fired. Okay. Who talked to you that evening about it? That was the two captains. And did you say anything? Strike that. Do you recall what they told you at that time? The captain says, I got you, and I got you by the book, right here. And what did you say? I didn't say anything. I was ordered to get out of the building. Was either of the captains saying, I have you by the book? Yes. Okay. And did Captain McDonald say anything at that time? Yes. I don't recall everything that was said, but yes, he did. Do you recall anything of what he said? Sign the paper. He would read it to me and just... Sign here, stuff like that. And did you say anything to either of those two gentlemen at that time? Very little. I did say some things, but very little. I don't recall. What you want to know? I don't know. I'm just asking you what you recall of the conversation. The night I got fired? Yes, yes, I recall. Can you tell me what the conversation was that night? That I didn't make a call to them. They got me by the book, signed this. We will read it to you. and. And you're out of here. And if you don't leave, we will call the police. And did you say anything in response? No, I had to leave. So you didn't say anything. You just let them finish and you left. I don't recall everything that I did say no. Well, we will cover it. Did you ever tell anyone there that you disagreed? Let's try that. Were there times when you were at the Toro Post that the post orders changed? They did change. Okay. And did you ever recall telling anyone at Pinkerton that you disagreed with a change in the post orders? I think I spoke to Carl. Carl. And do you recall when that was? Dates at this moment? No, I don't recall dates. And do you recall the substance of the conversation, what you told him? I had an incident that happened, and it was not in the post orders, and I talked to Carl about that. Well, let's explore this. Everything I did, I talked to Carl. That's fine. What incident was it? It was where someone went in the building and someone, they say, stole thousands of dollars worth of chips and I had no clear directions of who was supposed to go in the building and who was not to go in the building or when. It was not in the post manual. Now, the only thing that I had was ID, company ID, and sign a register. And so I'm still confused. Let me rephrase my question. It's your testimony that there were times when the post orders changed, is that correct? The post orders, daily post orders, or the post manual? The post orders. Now that was something different every day. Now what about the post manual? Did that ever change? To my knowledge, no. 
Let's go back to the post orders then. When the post orders changed, did you ever tell anyone there that you disagreed with the change in the post orders? No. Did you ever tell anyone there that you didn't think you were required to do something that you were told to do? Wait a minute. You said Pinkerton. Are you saying at Toro or are you saying with the company? What are you saying? It's not clear to me. Did you ever tell anyone, any of your supervisors, anyone there that you disagreed with a change in the post orders? I talked to Carl at length, just about everything. But did you tell him that you disagreed with a change in the post orders? I don't recall ever saying I disagreed with the post orders. I never recall saying that. Okay, if you mean something other than that, maybe I can understand you better. Did you ever tell Carl or anyone else at Pinkerton that you didn't think you were required to do something that you were told to do? No, I never rebelled like that, no. No, I never did that, okay. Do you recall a time at Toro when the video cameras weren't functioning at this moment? No, I don't. Maybe this will refresh your recollection. Were you ever told to increase the number of your patrols, your DTEX patrols or other patrols because the video cameras weren't working and they needed other added patrols for that reason. They told me to increase my DTEX, but I don't connect with the camera. That belonged to the company. I don't see what you're talking about. Were you ever told to increase the number of your DTEX patrols? Yes. Do you recall when that was? At this moment, dates? No. Do you recall ever telling Mr. Scott or anybody else there that you didn't want to increase the number of your patrols? No. Never? Never. Okay. I never talked to Mr. Scott that much. How about anybody else? Did you tell anyone else there that you didn't want to increase the number of your patrols? No. No one? I don't recall ever. Okay, that's fine. I may have complained. I don't know what you're really talking about. I'm trying to follow you. My understanding when working with my employer was be free to express yourself, ideas or things, to make things better or what. If you're asking me, did I exchange those ideas with Carl? Yes. But if you ask me, did I dictate policy? No, I didn't. And what type of things did you complain to Carl about? I don't think he said complain. Yes, he did. That was his exact word, but I'll rephrase it. I'll stick with the word complain. I'm sorry, go ahead. There was a lot of conditions that, being professional, that he asked me ideas on how to do that and to write him letters and put it in writing. And I felt free to do this and I tried to do this for the better of the business. And yeah, I did have a contact, a sort of rapport with Carl. I thought I did. And what were some of those things that you talked to him about? 